So for me, my faith journey started in 2016. Um, it was that was the year I gave my my life to the Lord, um, and I haven't looked back since. It was pretty soon after that that I I searched churches and then. God very quickly led me to C3 Barrel. And what I didn't know at the time, which I love telling people about, is behind the scenes, Dad had been praying I'd find C3 Barrel because he knew Pastor Nick. So not that I've written this down, but the day that I told Dad I needed a day off work and he asked me, what for? And I said, to go to church. Inside him was fireworks. Inside me, <laughs> inside me was terror because I was going to a place I vowed I would never go to. <laughs> and look at us now. But honestly, it doesn't take much for me to stand here and say that that's the best decision I've made in my 40 years of being alive. There's nothing else that comes close to being the best decision. That's it. Deciding to walk with Jesus, deciding to ask Jesus into my life. That's the best decision I've ever made. It's the best. And no matter what direction God sends us in, and I say us because I mean that us corporately as the body of Christ. He always has a plan, regardless of whether we can see that plan or not. And that's crucial. That's crucial, remember. So this year, we've been focusing on testimonies. Karen gave an amazing testimony a few weeks back. That was amazing, amazing. If you didn't see it, it's online. I strongly recommend you watch it. There's something beautiful about learning your people. There's something beautiful about learning the story behind the story. One of my guys in men's group coined that a few months ago. And it made me think that everybody has a story, but there's a story behind that story because it takes a lot for someone to let you in. And in in a testimony, you get in and it's beautiful. So I'm really enjoying this year so far. So we're learning about our church family. We're also learning testimonies about characters from the Bible. So last week I spoke on Ananias. That was fun. (laughs) Does anyone know how many Ananiases were mentioned in the Bible? There's three. I didn't know there was three when I first started studying that. I thought there was two. This is what Ken was saying before. That the, the Bible is alive and breathing. And no matter how many times you read it, God will give you something new. That's right. And, but put, it's, an extra one and put an extra one in there. But it's if we position ourselves to be available for that. That's so important. So we have to position ourselves to be ready to receive. So Ananias was interesting. We looked at Saul's Damascus Road conversion and we focused really on the role that Ananias played in Saul's early life. That's not what we're talking about today. Today, I want to focus on a character that made a very, very bad choice resulting in death. But before we get there, what's the shortest Bible verse in the Bible? I love this church. I think so. What's the second shortest? Yeah, I knew that would be a spanner in the works. Luke chapter, there's a few of these, but this is the one we're going with today. Luke chapter 17, verse 32. Remember Lot's wife. Three words. Today we're going to be learning about Lot's wife and looking at why Jesus calls us to remember her. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for this amazing church. We thank you that you are here. We thank you, Father, that the reason that we're all here today is because we made a choice. We made a choice to call you our Lord and Saviour. So, Father, we we pray today that you would reveal to us through your word and through your vessel what you want us to hear. Father, I pray that our hearts would be ready and our ears would be ready to receive. We pray a special blessing over this church, Father, and I pray that as we hear today what you've got for us to hear, Lord, that we would take that out into the streets and carry the flag for Christ and be ambassadors in a world that so desperately needs you. So we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. If you've got your Bible, chapter 19 in Genesis, that's where we're going to be spending the majority of our time. Um, if you don't, that's fine. I'm going to read the verses anyway. Lot's wife's, it's always weird when you do a sermon on someone who doesn't have a name and you've got to refer to them as someone else's wife. It's, it's always quite interesting. But that's what we're going to be doing. So I don't, I don't have a name for it to tell you about. We don't. It's um, Genesis chapter 19. That's okay. You're doing awesome. Hey, listen, I would hold a sermon and wait for you to find it. Trust me, I, I know the power of the Bible. So. so we won't read every single verse because we don't need to. So I'm going to summarize a fair bit of it. Let's, let's, let's 
before we look at Lot's wife, let's look at Lot. Mm -hmm. Because if we're going to refer to her as his wife, we better figure out who the guy is. Lot was the son of Haran, nephew of Abram or Abraham. At this point in the Bible, God hadn't changed his name. And Abraham would go on to be known as a friend of God, the father of all nations. Mm -hmm. After a fair bit of moving around, we see in Genesis 13, don't, don't turn there yet, um, that there was a bit of strife between Lot and Abram's herdsmen. Lot selfishly chose, this is a very brief summary, Lot, Lot very, very selfishly chose the lands where the plains of Jordan are. It was rich and it was lush. As the Bible says, it was well watered everywhere, like the land of the Lord. Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan. Not as nice, not as nice. And it was at this point that Lot left Abram and settled his family very close to the city of Sodom. Genesis 13, 13 puts it this way. Now, the people of Sodom were wicked and sinning greatly against the Lord. That's a verse in its own right just there. Yeah. That speaks massive volumes to the, to, the, to the wickedness and evilness of one city. So remember that as we keep talking about the rest of the story. So when we read all this, we have hindsight. So we, know the, how, we know the story. We know how the Bible ends. We know how it all goes. And really, it makes you cringe just a little bit hearing that Lot settled near Sodom. But again, that's hindsight. Lot selfishly chose to set up camp where it was a prettier, nicer, more lush location. But as we'll soon find out, the consequences of his choices were about to catch up to him. Genesis 14 tells of five kings in the area rising up against Lot. Then King Chedorlaomer, I think it is. I probably got that wrong. It's okay. We'll get there. He defeated all those rebelling kings. That resulted in the capture, the capture of Sodom and Gomorrah. And ultimately, Lot and his whole family got captured. When Abram heard of this, he and his fighting men attacked at night and won. They recovered Lot and his family, as well as the goods the army had taken from Sodom and Gomorrah. After that, Lot returned back to Sodom. This far into the story, we can see Lot hasn't made too many great choices. Let's skip to chapter 18, where now we have Abraham. God's changed his name. He's, inter he's interceding for Sodom which is absolutely fascinating to read. If you really, if you get a chance to read this, this is unbelievable. But Abraham asks God if he'll save Sodom for the sake of 50 righteous men. Yeah. As you keep reading, he then says, well, what about 45? Yeah. What about 40, 30, 20? Will you save Sodom for, for, for the sake of 10 righteous men? That's really important. Yeah. That part just there. So yeah. really remember that. 10 men. That is a very, very, very brief rundown of Lot and his family. Very brief. Let's now skip to chapter 19. And this is the bulk of today's message. There's a very, very valuable lesson that Lot teaches us, and it's all based on where his choice of living was. You can't decide to live near sin and think it won't affect you. I'm going to repeat that. You can't decide to live near sin and think it won't affect you because it will it will. 1 Corinthians 15.33 Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Yes. That's right. yes. Amen. You surround yourself around God's people. Yes. You fill yourself with God's word and good things and good things will come out. Amen. Pastor Ken taught me a long time ago. You squeeze a Christian, what's going to come out of him? Hopefully a little bit of Jesus. <laughs> that was very much a men's group thing. That was a men's group thing. <laughs> That was one of the many awesome things Ken told me, but that one always sticks with you. Because I just think of picking up some of the menu, like, squeeze him. Hopefully a little bit of good stuff comes out. All right. In this particular case, it wasn't only Lot in danger of being impacted by Sodom's sinful ways. It was also his family. Yes. We often forget there was other people involved in that. So it's not just us when we position ourselves in sin's way that's affected. It's the people around us. Yeah. Really important. That is something to be aware of. And bluntly put, if that's what you're doing, change it. Yeah. There's no two ways about it. We only get one crack at this life, so let's just make a good one. 
I remember when I was first saved and God was showing me, <laughs> he did try gently to begin with and then very much a little, sort of a little bit, not forcefully, but a little bit more less gentle. Less gentle. That's a very lovely way of putting it. A lot less gentle. And I remember God really just revealing to me that I was a saved Christian surrounded by stuff of the world. Yeah. I was only in my apartment. I was single at that time. So I culled everything. Well, yeah. Videos, games I was playing, yes. music. One of the yes. biggest ones was music. Yeah. Yes. That's a huge one. Yeah. You sing the lyrics to something, you're supporting it. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. You pay for it on Spotify, you're supporting that band. Yeah. Really important. That is good. Yep. What we what we sow into the what we sow into the world is what we're going to be known for. <laughs> for I love this man. <laughs> Very good. And what I did do instead, though, what I do, I love how rowdy you guys are. I love it. Don't ever change. It's great. What I did do instead, though, was instead of just culling and doing nothing. I introduced good things. Yes. I introduced good things. Absolutely. So what I did is I, I introduced great Christian music. Yeah, good. And if you think that there's only one type of Christian music, wrong. There are genres of Christian music. Again, I would encourage you to... Absolutely. And I would always encourage someone, and I have this conversation all the time, again, make sure it's biblical. Don't just sing it because it's labeled as a Christian music. That's right. Yeah, it's super important. Research what you're singing and buying. Make sure it's biblical. Make sure it's truth. Yes. Really important. I only willingly su support people who support truth. Yeah. I yeah. will not budge on that. That's just really important. Yeah. That is good. So my warning here is, be careful where you pitch your tent. Yeah. Mm. Be really careful. Lot made that mistake. Good word. Mm. So Lot's living in Sodom with his wife and family, living in a city that is so sinful and wicked, God's planning on destroying it. To end, again, we're going to just re go through it pretty quickly. Two, en two angels enter the city. Lot convinces them to stay at his house that night. Yes. Then the men of Sodom surround that house, demanding that Lot delivers the men to them so they could know them carnally. It's a really, really fascinating part of the Bible. Yeah, not a nice city. That's in verse 5. Lot refuses and instead offers the men of Sodom his own daughter. But there are men refuse this offer and threaten to do, to do even worse to Lot. This is not a nice scene. Mm -hmm. Then in verse 11 of chapter 19, we see the angels strike the men with blindness so they can't find the door to break in. <laughs> this is a horrible scene. It, no, it's, it, it, should, it should invoke in us some emotion. Absolutely. Don't ever be sorry. We should, this stuff should excite us and make us a bit emotional at the same time because this is a horrible scene. The key to the Bible is there's always a lesson. We're going to find what that is today, but there's always a lesson. So no matter what part of the Bible we read, there's a lesson. Yes. The next part of the story is the angels telling Lot and his family to get out of the city and get to safety because the outcry of Sodom had grown so great before the face of the Lord that the decision was made to destroy it. Just a little bit before, we were talking about Abraham negotiating with God and asking if he found 10 righteous men, would he save the city? There wasn't even 10 righteous men in that city. Wow. Wow. Fair income. Wow. Doesn't that make you think about Goulburn? Barrel? Mossvale? It really makes you think, doesn't it? They estimate there was around, and again, if there's any historians, correct me, they estimate there was in between 600 and 1,200 people in that city. There wasn't even 10 that could save that city because they were righteous and knew the Lord and lived in the Lord's ways. You know what it should do for us? Yeah. It's a way, yeah, absolutely. And you know what that should do for us? That should spur us on to proclaim the message of Christ to the world. So that's what that should do in us. Absolutely. We all have a mission. That's a different message though. I get really distracted. I love it. I love it. All right. It's great, isn't it? Tangent. Well, it's just because it's exciting. I find that just... It's believable, but I find it unbelievable that there wasn't even 10 men in that city that were right. I just, I don't struggle to believe it, but I just can't wrap my head around it. And it really does, yeah, it really does bring light to how bad that city was. That out of, even if we met in the middle and say 900 people, that out of 900 people, that's how bad the city was. 
bad. It was horrible. Yeah, yeah well. Exactly. Verse 16 and 15 and 16. Interesting verses. They speak of Lot's hesitation and delay leaving the city. Wow. It's interesting. <laughs> really, really, really hard hitting verses when you look at them properly. Mm. To the point where the angels actually grabbed them by hand wow. and took them out of the city. The evil tug of the world can be hard to get away from sometimes. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah. It's a double-minded. It's a mm. tragic story everywhere. Yep. It doesn't have to be, but it is. And at one point or another, the reality is we all felt the tug of that evil. Yeah. 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 Do you know why I know that? Because you're all sitting here today. Yeah. Yeah. Proving you chose a different path. Yeah. And I praise God for that. Amen. And when we think Lot has finally got the message he bargains with the angels on his way out of Sodom and he says let me settle in a smaller city of Zor still in the plain of Jordan rather than going to the mountains for if I go to the mountains someone's going to kill me Mm. wow it's God's love and patience that's just so exposed here the angels agree to Lot's request saying that he must hurry and get to Zor because he they won't, because God won't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah until Lot gets there. Mm-hmm. Isn't God just amazing? Yeah. Yeah. Like it's the simplest way I can put it. Yeah. There's no word strong enough or powerful enough or emotional enough to say how great God is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he gets special oh. yeah. He's always, always in our worst moments and in our best moments. Yeah. Yeah. So patient, so loving, and his mercy knows no bounds. Yeah. Yeah. And again... I could point to anybody in the room, I'm not going to, but they would be able to tell you, or you'd be able to tell me, numerous stories of God's love and patience and mercy. Uh, yeah. But we've missed something. Let's go back a bit. Verse 17. So it came to pass, when they, when they had brought them outside, that's the angels, the angels said, escape for your life. Do not look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plain, except for the mountains, lest you be destroyed. That main part there is the end bit of 17. Do not look behind you or stay anywhere in the plain. God, God allowed in his grace and mercy Lot to relocate somewhere within the plain still. Mm. Really important. That whole plain of Jordan, which is not a small area, by the way, was about to get pummeled. Mm. That's the bluntest I can be. So he showed great favor to Lot by letting him settle there. All they had to do was one thing. Don't look back super easy to sit here and say hey (laughs) let's read verses 23 to 26 of chapter 19 the sun had risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zor then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens so he overthrew those cities all the plain all the inhabitants of the city and what, was, and what grew on the ground in 26. But his wife looked back behind him and she became a pillar of salt. You know, Lot's wife's only mentioned three times in the Bible. Chapter, verse 15, verse 26, both in this chapter. And again, in Luke 17, 32, yeah, where Jesus says, remember Lot's wife. Yet for someone so minimally mentioned and not even named, she offers us very valuable lessons we can carry. So there's tons of lessons in that. We're going to focus on two. The first thing is looking back versus looking ahead. Lot's wife looked back. The Hebrew for looked back means more than just a glance over the shoulder. It's to regard, to consider, to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. Changes the way you look at it, eh? Really changes the way she looked back. Lot's wife wasn't looking back out of curiosity. She was, yeah, she was looking back at what she was leaving behind. Sin had, sin had its hooks in big time. Sin has a funny way of looking enticing to us humans and can steer us well off course. From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible warns of the devil's schemes. And remember that verse, the thief doesn't come to st- except to steal, kill and destroy. Jesus came so that we have, may have life and have it more abundantly. It doesn't really fit in the sermon. I just wanted to say it because it's a great verse. <laughs> Jesus really did come to give us life and life abundant. And sometimes we really need to remind ourselves and get a grasp of that. 
because it was so perfectly said today, gratitude. Yeah. Mm. Gratitude. There is always something we can be grateful for, hey? Yeah, that's right. Always. always. You do any mission work into any third world country, you will see that in more than a million ways. Well, of course, when I was first saved, we went into Africa, into Mozambique, and they literally had nothing and were the happiest children I have ever come across in my entire life. Grateful for everything. You know what they were most grateful for? We took over 50 soccer balls. Yeah. Flat. Yes. And two pumps. If I gave that to a kid these days, they'd be like, well, where's the PlayStation? Where's the Xbox? Yeah, that's right. And they just, yep, that's exactly right. And they just wanted soccer balls. It's a really perspective thing here, isn't it? Yeah, it is. All right, back to this message. I come across a lot of Christians who struggle with their faith as a result of not being able to let go of their past. People get stuck in a trap of thinking that their old life was just a little bit better, a little bit easier. Wow. That this life of Jesus can be a little bit too challenging sometimes. Yes. Can be. Yes. Yes. Yep. Almost identical to my next sentence. Love you, mate. <laughs> Worth every challenge. The reward for the effort we put in is uh, it's unmeasurable. Yeah. And you know why we can't measure it? Because we're not working just here. What we're doing now yes. is speaking for eternal. Amen. Amen. Yeah, we can't measure that. Eternity is a long time. So if you can't find anything to be grateful for when you get home, Think about eternity in peace, yeah. eternity with God. Yeah. If God is love, then I'm pretty happy to spend eternity in the presence of love. Yes. Yes. If hell is the opposite of that, that is, that is the distance of love. That's the exact opposite of love. Yes. Yes. I'm pretty sure if you put those two in that, I think I know which we're all going to choose. It's pretty simple when you, when you put it that way, hey? Philippians, the, Philippians 3, 13 and 14, Paul writes, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Jesus Christ. That perfectly measures his life on earth, striving towards eternity with God. That's awesome. It's a very powerful verse straining towards what is ahead. Paul's focused. He's deliberate. He knows what he wants because he knows what God wants. I think Paul really realized that looking back could prevent him from moving forward and ultimately miss the good things God had planned for him. Substitute Paul for you. If we get stuck focusing on the past, we risk missing what God's got planned for us. Take that one. That's a big one. There's a great lesson there. For us to keep moving forward, keep striving ahead, always aware that God has more and more planned for us, especially if you can't see it. If you can't see it, that doesn't mean it's not there. That's right. Really big lesson. That's right. Amen. Second lesson we're going to learn from Lot's wife is the significance of obedience to God's instructions. A lot of people don't like talking about obedience because it means we've got to behave and do some things we don't want to do sometimes. Mm. The interesting thing about this story is that they were warned about the impending destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. God didn't have to warn them. He didn't. Mm, very good. He did it out of love and mercy, but ultimately he did it out of his covenant with Abraham. And Amen. that's really, really important to look back on. He did it out of the covenant of Abraham. Yeah, he... Don't be sorry. Lot's wife was so captivated and ingrained in the lifestyle of Sodom. She was willing to be disobedient to God's commands to live her own way. I love you, mate. I love him. You know why I love Rob? The last few times I've preached and I'm about to get to a really, really like 
a heavy, a, a heavy <laughs> sentence. He says something that cracks everybody up, especially me, and I'm like, now I have to follow that with a heavy sentence. <laughs> Let's go back a step. Shh. Lot's wife was so captivated and ingrained. But shouldn't shouldn't church be fun? Yeah. Shouldn't shouldn't church be a bit like we've all been in churches where there's just no fun or I'm renowned for saying that in my ideal church, let the kids run rampant. Yes. I have this beautiful No, I love it. I I have a picture, I actually have a picture of me preaching with my daughter in my arm. What bigger blessing could there be than standing up and, and, and preaching the truth of God's word, holding the biggest blessing I've ever received? Okay. Yeah, he did. That's right. That's right. Because I, rea- I was rowdy. So, Lot's wife was so captivated and ingrained with the lifestyle of Sodom, she was willing to be disobedient to God's commands and live her own way. Is that us sometimes? Yes. Do we live 80% for God and just keep a little 20% for us? It's an interesting thing to think about, isn't it? The, the ratios clearly might be off. Again, I get that. It's, I'm dramatizing just to sort of get the creative juices flowing in your brain. But the enemy knows this. That's the key. The enemy knows that we're human. The enemy knows that we're vulnerable. Once. Yeah. That's one. <laughs> Wrong hand. The enemy knows this, and that's when that deceptive voice chimes in and says, don't worry, God won't find out. Uh, or, you do so much for God already, do this for yourself. Yeah. You know how you stop that voice? Get behind me, Satan. Yeah. Every time Jesus was tempted, what did he use? Yeah. The, the Word of God. Yeah. It is written. Yeah. You spend your time with good people, Christian people, people who believe in the truth, and you stay in the word of God, it's much easier to say, get behind me, Satan. Yeah, that is right. You spend your time living in the world and you, t- you pitch your tent near sin, near sin, the enemy will have a field day. You know why I know that? Because I've been there. We've all been there. We've all been an, living in the world at one point. My encouragement today is to live obedient lives for God. And I say that to you as much as I say it for myself. Because just for the record, when we stand up here, we're no different to anybody else. Yeah? That's why I love no, I love no podium. Yes. There is the foot of the cross is level and all churches should be level too. But I'm not going to, that's the whole different story. But just because someone stands up here and preaches, no different, no different. And the thing I love about our churches is that we know that. We know that. We don't try and hold ourselves to a different rule. There's no, it's, it's the same. It's the same. And, and that's something that we accept. Yep, well said. Yep. And we accept that. Absolutely. Yep. And that, and that keeps us accountable. Yep. And I love that. That's great. When we live obedient lives, we're showing God we trust him. We're showing God that we surrender to his authority and sovereignty in our lives. So I'm going to start to, to come to a close. But at the beginning of the message today, we spoke about Luke chapter 17, 32, which was remember Lot's wife. Now re- let's read chapter 17, 33 and 35. 33 to 35, sorry. 33, whoever seeks to save his life will lose it and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, on that night, two people will be in one bed. One will be taken, the other left. 35, two, two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken, the other left. I believe we're living in the last days and Jesus' return is imminent. This means we need to be ready. The body of Christ needs to be ready. We need to be prepared. Easy to sit here and say, but how do we do it? Simply put, we make sure our relationship with the Lord is right. We must be living in a way. I don't use the word must very often. But this stuff's important. Yeah, you're right. You do have a choice. And it's not for anyone up here to say you don't. You have the same free will that I do. But our hearts break for everybody to be in right standing with the Lord. Yeah. It's really, really important stuff. We must be living in a way that shows God honour. 
We must, and we should be quick to repent, quick to surrender ourselves to God's authority and commands. We'll have no warning when Jesus returns. As it says in 34 and 35, one moment we'll be there, the next we won't. Or terrifyingly, we will. This is the main reason Jesus calls us to remember Lot's wife, to ready us for his return, to warn us in advance that he's coming back and that we should be doing all we can to be ready. For us to be ready for Jesus' return, we must be ready for us to lose our... uh, Sorry, we must be ready to lose our life in order to save our life. We must be ready to... Willing, sorry, to surrender and live according to God's will in our lives. And as new creations, I encourage us all to continue living as Paul suggested, forgetting what's behind and straining to what's ahead. So today as I close, if you're here today and you know Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, then I encourage you, keep striving ahead. Keep working every day on your relationship. Don't look back. You're a new creation. Yes. Amen. Anticipate the return of Christ. Yes. Amen. And in the meantime, proclaim his name to every person you get a chance to. And if you can't do it with words, do it with actions. Yes. Because it could be tonight. It could be now. If you're sitting here today and you don't know Jesus, then I encourage you to act before it's too late. I encourage you to start your new life today to make the best decision you will ever make by asking Jesus into your life, into your heart as your personal Lord and Saviour. If that's you today, it would be an absolute honour to stand with you in prayer, to say the sinner's prayer with you, as we've all done at one point. So I'll be here at the end of this message for that or for any other prayer so let's pray to begin with lord heavenly father we thank you we thank you for the lessons we learn in this story we thank you for every person here we thank you father that you are so merciful so great so loving so perfect and jesus we say come we are ready father i pray you would speak into every person's heart today that you would speak to them in only ways that you can. And Father, if that heart doesn't know you, I pray that you would just, the tiniest of tugs on their heart, and that boldness would rise up. And Father, if that heart knows you, I pray you would fill them with love and peace, a peace that surpasses understanding, but also a holy fire that will drive that person ahead, ahead, ahead never looking back, striving for the eternal prize, the eternal reward of life with you. Father, we thank you for this amazing church. We thank you for the leadership. We thank you for every person that calls this place home. And Father, we pray that as we are one body, we would continue to be united, knitted tighter together with you. We pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening today, church. God bless you all.